Will you consider this? You're born in the slums of Kingston, Jamaica, but like every child, you have dreams. And while some of those dreams you thought should come true, they delivered a much larger audience for you. Stay right here to meet this inspirational dreamer and his connection to central Illinois. As a barefoot boy, he could run and smoke the competition. He managed to graduate from the prestigious Jamaican Defense Force and then went on to becoming a member of the first, and due to a Disney movie of the legendary Jamaican bobsled team, Devin Harris joins me now via Zoom as we keep on pushing. Welcome, Devin. Oh, man, thank you so much for having me. Well, Pleasure. you um, you're coming to Peoria. We'll get to that to him. Uh, get to that in a minute. But you have quite a story to tell. You had 15 kids in your family. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big family. I'm the first, though, the okay. first of uh, 15. <laughs> well, um, and then you, you know, I mean, you were running barefoot in the streets of uh, Kingston. Uh, Jamaica is not known for its wealth. It's it's a vacation spot, but you had a dream of one day being in the Olympics. I mean, that's kind of a crazy dream. Yeah, you know, um, well, Jamaicans are dreamers, and I'm one of those uh, Jamaicans who dream big. I have to say though that you, you mentioned the army. That my first and the dream that drove me the most when I was younger was actually to become an army officer, which um, was rather daunting. And, I, you know, and after I accomplished that, I remember I was 21 years old walking down to the officer's uh, mess and having this really intense conversation with myself. You know, so you're 21 years old, you have achieved your big dream, you're an army officer now. What are you going to do with the rest of your life, man? I'm like, Oh yeah, the Olympics, and so I started um, redoubling my efforts in a, in order to achieve that dream. But you thought you wanted to go to the Olympics as a runner, and you were a, a, a mid distance runner. You weren't a sprinter. Yes, you know the, the the good and bad thing about being in Jamaica, growing up in Jamaica, is that everybody sprints fast, and if you're not one of those who's blessed with that fast twitch muscle, then you know you're not winning anything. And so um, I really, really wanted to win something. And so I started running uh, 800 and 1500 meters. And that's where I thought I would compete at the Olympics in. And so, you know, back in, um, this was 1987 when I redoubled my effort to compete in the Olympics. I thought I was going to compete in the 88 Seoul Olympic Games, but as fate would have it, I, I turned out that I competed in the 88 Calgary Olympic Games instead. Which seems really crazy, but the movie Cool Runnings brought, um, brought the story to the people who hadn't paid attention to the Olympics. They, uh, they took a lot of liberties with the story. However, um, but you made it. So in, in 1987, September of 1987, is the first time you ever saw a real bobsled, is that right? Uh, that's actually correct. The, the team selections were in Jamaica, and that's just, you know, really about testing your athletic prowess. And uh, after we were selected, we went to Lake Placid, New York, met our coach there, Howard Seiler, and he had a two-man bobsled in his driveway. And that's the first time we are seeing a bobsled, which, you know, you look back now, it's kind of a crazy story. How can you expect to go to the Olympics in February of 88, and the first time you're actually seeing a bobsled was in September of 87. But, you know, as luck would have it, we pulled it off. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, so I guess somebody had the idea, because you have push cart um, derbies in Jamaica every year. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same form, but really, uh, really not very not, close not at all. Really. <laughs> yeah. So the, the push carts are, are push carts are very prevalent in Jamaica. We use them to transport wares in the marketplace. And every year, yeah, they would kind of spruce them up and they race them down, down this winding mountain road. And two Americans saw that, two crazy guys going down the side of a hill in a cart, 
except for the ice, it reminded them of bobsledding. And then they discovered that a big part of a bobsled race is the start. And of course, Jamaica has lots of sprinters uh, that you could transfer those skills to bobsled pushing. Um, and so, yeah, you, you think about the fact that it's a winter sport. It's more geared towards sprinters. I'm a middle distance runner. All the odds were stock, stacked against me, but here I am. Yeah, you a retired are. Olympic bobsledder. And you're still inspiring people. So let's get back to a little bit of the story. So you didn't have any sponsors, but there you are. You have qualified for the bobsled team, and then you needed to eat while you were training. Tell me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> difficult. Um, you know, we just found a way. You know, my, my favorite uh, uh, phrase to use is, is to keep on pushing, which obviously has a bobsled knowledge, but we just found a way to keep on pushing. I often tell the story of um, being in Calgary this one particular day, an incredibly cold, long, hard day of training, and all I could afford for dinner was one chicken leg, a roll, and a small soda. We were over in Europe, still trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to feed ourselves. And that's when we came up with the idea to, to create these bobsled shirts. So everybody who remembers 1988 will remember the, the, the shirts to make a bobsled the hottest thing on ice. And we would go into clubs um, at night with those shirts on our arms and we'd dance up beside a couple and whip one out and go, hey, man, you want to buy a shirt? And the guy would say, no, the girl says yes. And he ends up paying and we had money for dinner. <laughs> so we just figured a way to, 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 to keep going. And then, so, I mean, when you were, when you were in Jamaica and you were just kind of doing a, a push cart to learn the timing and everything, but then when you were actually on the ice, number one, you didn't know how to function on the ice. And number two, you had to get all that timing down in a completely different atmosphere. So you were watching a lot of the other teams and, and taking in, absorbing all of that information. Is that right? Asking questions and absorbing. Yes, there's a, there's a, um, a, a couple of pictures on Facebook of my friend from Australia who I raced against posted. And this is at the Olympic Games. And so even at the Olympics, we were always watching. And so there's a picture of me watching them, the Australian, go down and another one of me watching the Swiss team go down. So we're always watching and learning because we we knew we didn't know enough and we didn't have a lot of time to go through the normal trajectory. So we were really pushing ourselves hard to transition from being in Jamaica to being in a winter environment, being on a real side, and then just trying to in addition to asking questions through observation, pick up any nuances that we could, that we could then apply to our own um, pushing of the sled. Were they pretty generous with the information? Uh, the, the movie kind of depicts yeah, the, maybe, maybe you were, you know, clowning around, but, but you really did get some good legitimate help. Yeah, well, you know, the movie is a comedy, and I think um, because people think of us Jamaicans as easygoing people, they, they figure they'll do a comedy, uh, which is fine. It's entertaining, and I get that. But then there are some very serious lessons in the movie as well, and and, and the depiction of the commitment that we had. Um, and certainly my experience uh, back in 80, that the people were helpful. Um, none of the, the conflicts that you saw in the movie existed, really. Um, and, and so before the Olympics, people, um, people tend to be more helpful before the Olympics, less helpful during the Olympics. Right. Because well, it's, competition uh, it's is the competition. one race where everybody's playing for all the marbles, you know? Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, and you, you wanted those marbles. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you started out, you were supposed to be maybe a, a two-man, um, two-person bobsled, but at the last minute, mm -hmm. you added a fourth. Yeah, we actually um, did do the, we did compete in a two-man event. Um, Dudley Stokes and Michael White did those events. And then the second week of the Olympics, and this is how crazy our story is, we were not entered as a four-man team. We had never, ever raced a four-man sled. But during the Olympics, we decided that we will enter the four-man and um, our um, our, our driver, Douglas Stokes, he had a brother, Chris, who was on a track scholarship in Idaho, Idaho, Moscow, Idaho. 
And he was now in Calgary to watch his brother race. It was his first week of exposure to bobsledding. And we recruited him that week. And in three days, taught him everything we knew about pushing a sled. And yes, at the end of the week, we pushed the seven classes start time. That's just amazing. Just amazing. And so then um, in the film, and people who watched the Olympics saw um, you had a crash. And it, the four mm -hmm. men had a crash. And tell me about that, because how fast were you going? And the only protection you had was headgear, really. Mm. Yeah, well, welcome to the sport of bobsledding, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we were going, I can tell you, exactly 78.5 miles an hour. That's what it says on the screen there. Um, I, I remember we're heading down the track and, um, you know, we we exited corner eight and we hit the wall and, and in my head. I'm, I'm the second guy in the sled. I'm right behind the driver and I'm thinking, well, that's not good, but we have a long straight away before corner nine to correct the issue. And then we hit the wall again just before we entered corner nine. I'm like, okay, that's definitely not good. We're going to do what we call a wave. And if you watch the film, you'll see the sled kind of going in and out of frame. That's the waving. Mm -hmm. And I anticipated that we would get around to the end of the corner and, you know, slam into the wall and continue on our merry way. But instead, we went over. And that's because we had literally ran out of wall. At that point, when the sled should have been going down off the corner, we were going up and we just, we hit. And I remember thinking, um, oh my God, we're over. How embarrassing. And I know people look at the crash and go, oh, how, how horrible, how terrifying. They must be fearing for their lives. And in that moment, I was not fearing for my life. I was just embarrassed um, by the fact that we had crashed, we had failed in front of the entire world. Um, and we had let down a country, you know? That's, that's what was going through my head. And it's a really long ride. It feels like forever when you're on a in a bobsled crash going down on your head. Mm -hmm. But as true Olympians, as true athletes, you got up and you walked away to the end of the track. Yes, this is true. Um, and, I, and I know how dramatic uh, the movie made that look, but you know, it's really was one of those things that you had to do anyway. You had to get off the track, so you, you walk off the track. You know, the, the, the most amazing part of that experience for me is as I was walking on the track, feeling dejected and like a total failure, were how fine the people in Calgary were. People started to cheer, we love you, we love you. And I remember one guy had reached over into the track to shake my hand and I shook it. And then I had to shake almost every other hand as I tried to exit stage left. So feeling crappy, but... You know, at least for a little while, they made me feel better. You stood with pride, backs tall. So now, uh, in your retirement from bobsledding, and you went to the Olympics three times, uh, what are you doing in your spare time? I know you've written a book. I, I have a copy of this. I don't have the children's copy Ooh. yet. But when you come to Peoria, we'll get the children's copy as well, and we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. But you're an inspiration now. Well, you know, um, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a series of life experiences that allow me to share uh, the insights and lessons from that, that, um, you know, people from around the world um, are able to relate to. Uh, you know, I, I often say that success principles are universal. And me being able to share uh, my journey of, you know, coming from Olympic Gardens, as you mentioned, to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst from Jamaica to the Winter Olympics, um, really lends itself to some valuable life lessons as well. And so I've been able to travel around the world and I'm excited to come to Peoria as well to share those uh, insights and those lessons. Because um, everyone has failures in their life and if they say that they haven't, then they're probably not being very truthful. Um, exactly. and, and you've managed to, to zero in on that and, again, uh, encourage people to keep on pushing because we're all different incarnations of ourselves as we go through life. Yeah, you know, and, and clearly the, the keep on pushing has a bobsled analogy. That's how you start the race, you push the thing, right? Um, and even, 
uh, uh, as you're heading on a track in a real way, you're still pushing against the ice conditions, the weather conditions, the twists and turns of the track. And yes, you're pushing against the limits of your own abilities, right? You're trying to um, do better than what you did bef before. So it's uh, always a reiterative process, like the reincarnation, as you just mentioned. I think all of us have that ability, and I would dare say that responsibility to find a way to um, identify the skills that we need, whether they be technical skills or intrapersonal skills, and always work on in developing and improving those skills so you can become um, the best version of yourself. And you have a foundation. You haven't forgotten your roots. You have, um, you're giving back to the, those less fortunate in Jamaica. Is that correct? Yes, you know, I, I think all of us have benefited from someone who has gone before us, every single one of us, right? And we will never know who that person was down the line, two or three generations that made a difference uh, in our lives. Um, but those persons are there. And I so believe that, you know, all of us have a responsibility, I believe, to um, once you're making some progress on your own journey to find a way to reach back and help someone. You know, the, the challenge for most people is that they think that they, it, that that effort requires millions of dollars. And yes, I do have a foundation. You don't need a foundation. I happen to have a foundation. Um, I, because I can so resonate with those kids at my old elementary school. I am one of them. You know, I ran around in that same schoolyard and sat in those same classrooms, and I've been around the world a little bit, um, you know, places I could never have dreamt of when I was sitting in those classrooms. And I want to go back and, and more than just, you know, provide a breakfast for them and um, school supplies, which are all very important things, you know, hopefully hold myself up as an example to go, hey, I am one of you and I have done this. And you have the ability, the potential to do the same, if not greater. So you encourage them to dream as well. You're providing for them, but you're encouraging them to keep their dreams alive. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that, you know, one of the things that we all have in common is that we're all kids at one point in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And the things we know about kids is that they all dream. Um, and I don't want those dreams to be hampered. I want to to um, to pamper them instead. I want I want to encourage them. And so, you know, through the work of the foundation and me going back as a, as a past student of that school, very school, I'm hoping to encourage those dreams. Are you also encouraging bobsledding in Jamaica? Do you continue to encourage that? I have been um, heavily involved with with the federation over the years. Um, over the last what was it, two or so years, I've kind of stepped back, but the the program is still going for sure. Well, that's pretty exciting, and I know that there was um, after twenty four years, I believe it was twenty four years, there was a female bobsled team. So you. Mm -hmm. You encouraged them in some way, inspired them. I was, uh, indeed, I was part and parcel of that. Um, uh, you know, I ran the program exclusively um, uh, during the development of that team that made it to Pyeongchang in Korea. And then, of course, you know, the big news was from the last Olympic Games where we had a four-man team qualifying, you know, 24 years or so after our four-man team made its debut. So all of that was exciting. I bet. Um, do you attend a lot of the Winter Olympics as a result of your having participated? Um, it's, it, it doesn't quite work that way. I have been to um, most of the Olympic Games um, or have attended or, you know, as a spectator, which in the beginning was really, really hard, I have to tell you. Um, because yeah, it's, you it's, weren't participating, that was hard. Because you weren't, you weren't in it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I, my first, my first time going to the Olympics and not competing was in Salt Lake City, two thousand two, and I don't, I felt horrible. I'm like, there's no reason why I shouldn't be in this race. I used to beat him, you know, <laughs> but um, I've gotten over it now. I'm, you know, I'm in withdrawal. I was in withdrawal mode then. I'm, I've gotten over it now, and it's just nice to be able to go and 
kind of just soak up the atmosphere as a, as a spectator now. And uh, historic, I mean, you made history, which is, you know, not everybody gets to make history in their lives. So that must be kind of daunting to you every once in a while to take a look. Yeah, you, you've kept on pushing, but to take a look and just say, wow, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, you know, when you're doing this, you're not even thinking about the, the overall impact. You know, we were not. We were just trying to learn the sport and then to give a really good representation for our country. And I remember being in Calgary in 2014 with my teammates from 88 and the team that was trying to qualify for the Sochi uh, Olympic Games were filming something. And I, and I said to the guys, wow, can you imagine this? Can you imagine what we have started and how we have inspired, yes, a new generation of Jamaican boxers, but we have inspired people from around the world. That's that's really um, something special, not something we had ever anticipated, but really proud to be a, a part of. We, um, in central Illinois, we're, we're very flat here. We have a river, we have, you know, some hills were very flat, but we have a young man who's on the North American Cup uh, team trying to qualify for the 2026 Olympics. So I'm hoping that you get to meet him. I interviewed him a couple weeks ago and, and you can give him some encouragement. He's the brake man and, and he can keep on pushing. Indeed. That, well, that's what great men do. You're, you know, our great men are pushers. They, they keep on pushing. But that's amazing. That's awesome. You know, it just goes to show whether you are from a tropical, a hilly environment or a flat, you know, um, sulfur plains area. It doesn't matter, man. It's the dream and the drive and the desire to do something that may be out of your normal realm, out of your comfort zone, but you can still get it done. Yeah. All right. So you'll be in Peoria speaking uh, at for Founders Day at the Creve Corps Club or uh, affiliated with Creve Corps Club mm -hmm. in May, the middle of May, May 16th. And the, these are the things you'll be discussing. Keep on pushing. And, and what other messages do you have of us uh, for us here in central Illinois? Well, I, I hope to, first of all, bring that warm Jamaican smile. Uh -huh. um, I like it. So, so, and, and... And, uh, and have that like cross-cultural experiences. But yeah, you know, tell the story of the Jamaican bobsled team. I, I think most people are more familiar with the story in the movie, which is, uh, you know, it's loosely based on, on the true story. It's a, uh, I think from our conversation, you get that sense that um, in many ways, the true story was more incredible than what's in the movie. And then just, the idea, yes, of you know having that dream, that vision, um, that regardless of what the challenges you're facing, um, you can always overcome those, right? You can, your, your your dreams, your vision allows you to be greater than your circumstances suggest that you can be, and then to recognize that you have to put in that work, man. That that elbow grease, exactly. uh, you know, taking action towards your dreams. You know, just dream them, and it happens. And always constantly working on yourself as well and learning to work as a team and persisting. You know, those are some of the messages I want to share. So you have been questioned for all these years about this whole experience and especially since Cool Runnings. What is one question you haven't ever been asked that you think you should have been asked? Ooh, ah, I don't know what that is. I, I, think, I kind of feel like I've been asked everything in different ways. I was just asked yesterday because I was speaking. And it's, I want to say it was perhaps the third time I've ever been asked that question. And it was, at what point back in 88 did you guys think you couldn't, you wouldn't make it? And, and the answer is, we never thought that, you know? We embarked on this thing and it turned out, uh, I realized that, well, it was a little bit more difficult than I thought it would have been. But I never thought it was impossible, not once. Which um, is, so. that, and that is a true um, athletic um, competitor's mindset. And, and you came from that perfectly. Yeah, you know, um, I wanna say, yeah, uh, athletes, but those people who are um, determined 
uh, to achieve their goals, right? It's if if you are if you have that determination that, that and that drive to achieve, yes, you will find it difficult, but you won't n ever ever think it's impossible. There's always a chance. Good for you. And that's your message. That's your encouragement. Well, thank you very much for being here. I know you're not feeling well, so I hope you're feeling better by the time you get to Peoria. And um, time for <laughs> I look forward to meeting you in person. Same here. Thanks Same for well. Thank you for having me on. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us and learning more about the very first Jamaican bobsled team with Devin Harris. And he'll be in Peoria in May. Maybe you'll get to meet him. Again, thank you for being here. Stay safe and healthy and hold happiness.